Greetings, members and friends of Emmanuel United Church of Christ. So glad that you've joined us here as we come almost to the conclusion of our study of Paul's epistle to the Colossians. Uh, we have this session and we have one more to conclude this letter, but this essentially is the climax of the letter. And it's one of those passages that many people shy away from, and for good reason. It's full of all kinds of challenges. And so as we go through this, I trust that you'll try to navigate your way through this passage with me and try to find what it is that we can learn from what is essentially a very hard text for us moderns because it is instruction given in the cultural context in which Paul lives in the first century ancient world. And so we're going to be looking at a text, don't have a knee-jerk reaction to it. We're going to try to parse it and work through what it is we can gather as instruction for us in how to live the gospel in our own domestic lives, how to live the gospel at home. And so, as always, I want to share the entire passage with you before we begin. It's Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 through chapter 4, verse 1. And Paul writes, Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is your acceptable duty in the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children or they may lose heart. Slaves, Obey your earthly masters in everything, not only while being watched and in order to please them, but wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever your task, put yourselves into it as done for the Lord and not for your masters, since you know that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You serve the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong has been done, and there is no partiality. Masters, Treat your slaves justly and fairly, for you know that you also have a master in heaven. This is the text we'll consider in a message titled, At Home with the Gospel. Now, it's important to note we're at the end of Paul's great epistle to the Colossians, and we've covered some very transcendent territory, some very elevated themes. If we go all the way back to chapter one, we have that great Christ hymn where Paul says that Christ is the image of the invisible God. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, that Christ is united heaven and earth through the reconciliation of cross and resurrection, so that in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and our lives are hidden with Christ in God. This elevated territory, speaking of the transcendence of Christ and of his righteous rule and reign. And therefore, as we move through this letter, Paul says, since our life is hidden with Christ in God, we need to put to death all these vices, lust, greed, and anger. And we need to put on compassion, kindness, humility, patience, forbearance, and forgiving love. And we are to dwell together as a body at peace so that whatever we do, we do in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to glorify God the Father. That's what has preceded the text that we're about to study. And now we come to the pinnacle. Worship as the body of Christ is not the pinnacle. The pinnacle for Christ is living the gospel in our homes. Living the gospel must begin in our domestic life. We need to be, as my title puts it, at home with the gospel, because for Paul, the grand climax is the gospel should impact our domestic life. And it's reasonable to say that because that's where we spend most of our life. And so he considers three basic relationships of ancient households, which I've summarized here on the text be screen before you. We have marriage husband and wife, we have parenting, father and child, and then we have slaves, master and slave. And it's because of the challenge of this passage that people often have a kickback against this text. Clearly, Paul is writing in the midst of a patriarchal culture. You can see that in even how the text is structured. He addresses the male of the household three times. The same person in a household would be the husband, would be the father and would be the master. And he's addressing the male in the household because in Paul's time, 
the male was considered the head of the household, the pater familia. That's how Greco-Roman society was. That's how Jewish society was. And particularly in Greco-Roman society, the pater familia, the head of the household, is the one that had full legal rights, the power over all of those who were in his household. And because Paul is writing within a patriarchal culture, some theologians automatically assume that Paul is a male chauvinist or a misogynist. And you know, if you've spent time with me, I don't think that that is a fair accusation against Paul. But some people come at Paul this way, and they regard the passage we're about to look at as an embarrassment. They read it with suspicion or overt hostility. Elizabeth Fiorenza a uh, feminist theologian says that we can only read this passage that we're about to look at by unmasking this text as promoting patriarchal violence. That's her evaluation. We must unmask this text as promoting patriarchal violence. Now, we can't fault Paul for living in a different culture from ours. Paul clearly writes from within a patriarchal culture, as all ancient writers would. But I don't believe he's promoting violence. In fact, I think he's promoting something quite different, the peace of Christ reigning and ruling in a first century household. And the reason I think that is not only the words that he uses, but if we're very careful with Paul, we see that he's rather progressive. He's challenging the status quo of his culture, and he's speaking in unconventional ways. Because if he were just speaking within a patriarchal context, he would only address the paterfamilia. He'd only address the male, the husband, the father, the master. But he doesn't. He also addresses, and in fact, first addresses in each of our pericopes here, wives, children, and slaves. All are addressed as moral agents in their own rights, not just the male, but the females, the children, and the servants. And all who are treated as moral agents in their own right are called to live Christ's lordship in their family role. And if we're very careful with Paul, we see that he calls for mutual love and respect between husband and wife. He calls for obedience and tenderness between children and parents. And he calls for integrity and justice between servant and master. And so my approach to this passage before us will be quite simple. I don't believe we should throw away or ignore this text as the lectionaries do. Our lectionary never has us cover these household codes that are found in Colossians and also Ephesians. I don't throw them away or ignore them because I think they're written in a context that we must be aware of and we must understand how that influences what is said, but there's also something to learn. We shouldn't let the abuses and distortions of this text stop us. Yes, people can use this text in a very negative and wrong way. But if we go that route, we'll never cover anything of significance because everything can be abused and distorted. I instead think we need to come at this text understanding that for Paul, Christ's lordship makes a difference in his culture and it's meant to make a difference in ours. Paul doesn't defy first century norms. That's the only context in which he has to speak. He doesn't defy the norms, but he does seek to transform them by appealing to Christ. He wants to transform the norms because this is the only context in which he has to make his appeal. And so as I approach texts like this, I understand always there are twin dangers. One of the dangers is that we appropriate this text without any thought for the ancient cultural expression, that we just kind of seek to live as if we lived in the first century Greco-Roman or Jewish world. That's not how we need to approach this. But I also don't think we should appropriate the other danger, and that is throwing this out completely without looking for the insights in this passage. And so let's begin to try to look into this passage, and we'll begin with the first pericope, the first coupling here, Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. 
Now, obviously, you see the most controversial word in this text, and it always sounds oppressive to us moderns, and perhaps rightly so. Wives, be subject or be submissive to your husbands. We have a reaction to that because we know the potential for abuse with that kind of language. But please know that's not Paul's intention. For Paul, submission or subjection does not convey an innate inferiority. A soldier submits to a sergeant, and yet the soldier is not in any way inferior. And so when we read about being subject, we're not hearing Paul say, be a doormat, be a compulsive pleaser, and we certainly aren't hearing Paul say, accept mistreatment or abuse. Instead, I think he's saying something akin to, give yourself to the other in understanding and support and understand that the one you're giving yourself to in support is called to this husbands love your wives and never treat them harshly if a wife is called to submit it is submission to the husband's love not to his tyranny there's no call to submission to tyranny or abuse there is a call to submit or accept or support or understand or embrace the love that is shown to you without any harshness. And Paul makes it clear, don't treat her harshly. Now that is unconventional advice in Paul's culture because in Paul's culture, marriage was generally viewed as a means to produce legitimate heirs. It wasn't even really about love. But here Paul says, no husband, I want you to love your wife, as Christ loved the church, to sacrifice your interest for her own welfare, to treat her with understanding and not with harshness. Do not be embittered toward her. Do not treat her in a way that is wrong. Yes, there are struggles in marriage and there are challenges, but Paul says, I want there to be this mutual understanding and support and respect in the marriage relationship. That's why I love Paul. Uh, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, the message, where he puts it this way, wives, understand and support your husbands by submitting them to them in ways that honor the master. Husbands, go all out in love for your wives and don't take advantage of them. If we get at the kernel here, if we move past some of the words that might challenge us or the way that Paul phrases this, we understand that Paul is advocating that in a marriage, there be mutual love and respect and not bitterness or manipulation. Neither party is to be arrogant or domineering. There are to be no power plays in this relationship. Men shouldn't abuse their physical strength. Females should not manipulate. Instead, all parties must forego the temptation to use any variety of domestic blackmail. And that, of course, is a good word for our culture in a day when we're obsessed with securing our own personal rights or advancing our own interest or getting our way in any way possible. Paul instead says, I want you to show mutual love and respect. This is why I love David Garland's quote in this regard. He says, marriages fail when struggles for power between the couples get out of hand and one wants to dominate the other whether by overt means or in more subtle ways. They treat the marriage as if the goal was the conquest of the other. And of course, that can never be the goal of a healthy and sound marriage. The goal is not to win. The goal is not to dominate. The goal is to build up and support and love through mutual love and kindness and caring respect. So that's Paul's first coupling. And then he moves on to the parent-child relationship. And he writes, children, obey your parents in everything, for this is your acceptable duty in the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke or exasperate your children, or they may lose heart. And again, unconventionally, Paul addresses the children first, children who had no legal rights in the ancient world, children which were just part of the household, Paul puts them on equal level with their parents and says, children, you have a real relationship with the Lord, and one of your obligations in your relationship with the Lord is to listen to your parents. Do that so that you might please the Lord, but understand this, and this is why the fathers are addressed. We can abuse this. 
No one has the potential to harm a child like a bad parent. And therefore, Paul compliments that call for children to obey their parents with the challenge to fathers in particular here as the paterfamilia, as the head of the household, do not exasperate or provoke your children or they may lose heart. Do not provoke, do not irritate, do not exasperate your children. You don't want them to lose heart. Now, what's assumed in this coupling is that children need discipline. But what is also assumed is children need more than discipline. Without discipline, without guidance, without some kind of structure, children won't grow up with healthy self-regulatory skills. But discipline alone can be destructive rather than enabling. You don't want a 24-7 coach. You need a little bit more than a coach. In fact, you need a lot more than just simply a coach or a disciplinarian in a parent-child relationship. And it's interesting because it connects to our modern world. In the ancient world, there were various ideas of how you ought to treat a child. Some said you rule them with an iron hand. Others would say, you know, too much discipline breaks the heart. There were the strict disciplinarians, the Puritan Bartholomew Batty argued in the 15th, 16th century that God specifically created the buttocks to receive blows without causing serious bodily injury. <laughs> That's Bartholomew Batty. He was a strict disciplinarian. Of course, we also know that in our world, people complain about permissiveness. And you see these memes on Facebook all the time, people from the older generation saying, oh, the kids have it easy and, and parents aren't nearly as harsh on their children as they should be. And if they were more harsh and more disciplinarian, then children would be much better. We hear that kind of language all the time. There's always a challenge about how much discipline, what form of discipline to use. We all agree on this though. We all agree that those who withhold discipline hate their children. That's Proverbs 12, 34. Those who withhold discipline hate their children because children need to learn how to self-regulate. They need boundaries, they need guidance, they need fences, but they're to be able to roam free within these fences. Paul understands this as well, that Discipline's needed, but it shouldn't be too strict, and it shouldn't be 24-7, and whatever form of discipline is used, Paul is concerned that parents, and fathers particularly, are not overly stern or heavy-handed. Again, the message here is helpful. Children, do what your parents tell you. This delights the master to no end. Parents, don't come down too hard on your children or you'll crush their spirits. Discipline is one thing, but driving children to exasperation or resentment is another. Discipline can be excessive. You can have too much of a good thing. Constant nagging or belittling will discourage rather than discipline. It can break a child's spirit and make them listless and responsive. And Paul here is concerned not only about the parent and their discipline, he's concerned about the child's point of view and their feelings. He's concerned that parents can abuse and misuse their authority in destructive and abusive ways. And so Paul doesn't say discipline at all costs. He actually sets boundaries for the parent's authority. Now, again, that's progressive in the first century. It's unconventional. He doesn't defy the first century norms, but he does transform those norms through the gospel. And he recognizes that children are not simply legal property as the ancient world saw them. They're owed dignity as human beings in their own right. He assumes that children are to be loved and accepted and valued for who they are, and their obedience is not the condition of parental love. Parental love transcends whether they are obedient or not. And so that's the second coupling. And then we come to the third and the most challenging coupling because no one in their right mind would ever see slavery as a good thing. And yet in the ancient world, it was commonplace. It was typical. It is the way the world worked. There's no major culture that did not have servants. And we know that in the first century world, about one third of the population 
were servants. It was an entrenched reality that early Christians could neither change nor ignore. However, one of the most unconventional things that early Christianity did is it welcomed all. There's neither slave nor free, male nor female, Jew or Greek, but all are one in Christ. And one of the ironies in the ancient world is that a servant who had no legal rights in a household could actually be an elder over his or her master in church service. And so Christianity already begins to transform the landscape by allowing servants to have an equal place of dignity and expression within the church. And that's challenging. It's transformational. But yet slavery was still a reality. It is just how the world worked at that time. And in the first century household, servants had no legal rights. Now, not all slavery was debased and painful. Some servants managed households, some ran businesses for their masters, but they were still dehumanized. They were still considered, according to Aristotle, as, quote, a thing, living property, or a living tool. And so a servant was not due any justice. There was no injustice in relationship to a thing. And that's how the first century world worked. But Paul, again, is going to defy conventions. He's going to speak about justice within this framework of addressing servants because he addresses them first again, and he addresses them as moral agents, as people of dignity. He says, servants, obey your masters in everything. And he addresses them in a way that he calls them to integrity in their work. He doesn't want them to merely go through the motions. He wants them to give sincere, wholehearted service because they are serving the Lord. And he speaks of how in glory they will inherit the same reward that their master does. And so he speaks to them with dignity. He speaks to them with respect. He calls them to live with integrity. And then he ends this by addressing the master, master. Treat your slaves justly and fairly. That's unheard of in Paul's day. This is progressive. You know that you also have a master in heaven. And so he says to the masters, you know, you better treat your servants with justice and with fairness because you, master, have a master in heaven. And you are not exempt from accountability to the Lord, regardless of your status. And you certainly are not superior to your servants, because according to the gospel, all are beloved and accepted in Christ. And you, dear master, are accountable to the master for the treatment of your servants. And so that's the last section. And what's interesting about this whole reading is we live in a different world. And though the ancient structures have collapsed, I want to suggest that the heart of Paul's counsel remains. Yes, we reject patriarchalism and male domination. But we also affirm with Paul that married love shouldn't degenerate into a battle over each other partner's rights to fulfillment, that it shouldn't be a self-centered competition for control, that there should be mutual love and respect and not manipulation and bitterness. Yes, we reject some forms of discipline. We see that some can be abusive and some can be harsh, but we also recognize with Paul that children need to know that they do have a responsibility to their families, that they do have this real relationship with God and where they are as children calls them to obey their parents, but those same parents need to discipline with tenderness and with patience because children are human beings worthy of dignity, the same dignity and respect we give to others. And finally, because we don't live in the ancient world, we certainly reject slavery as an institution. But we see that Paul's going a little bit deeper. He's trying to transform the landscape as much as he possibly can in that time to say that, yes, we should serve others with integrity. And if we have people who serve us, we should treat them with justice and equity. These unconventional commands of Paul reflect the new order of Jesus Christ, because Paul isn't in a place where he can defy first century norms, but he is in a place where he can begin to transform them by appealing 
to Christ. And the thing I find noteworthy about this text is how many, dear friends, how many societal problems could be lessened if we showed mutual and love respect between husbands and wives, if there was obedience and tenderness between children and parents, if there was integrity and justice between worker and master. Certainly, we can't directly apply all that we read from this text to our lives because Paul's writing in a different culture, but we can learn from them rather than ignore this text and learn how to be at home with the gospel. Now, most people won't touch this text with a 10-foot pole, and of course, you all know at this point how different I try to approach these texts, how I understand there is a interpretive horizon, how we, as we look at the sacred scriptures that take place in a different world, in an ancient world, in another world, don't allow us to just simply take the text and apply them without any interpretation, without any thought. People that do that can be very abusive in the way that they interpret and bring these texts into the real world, into home. But what we try to do is to see, well, this is that world. This is how it looked there. What principles there? What, what, what is at the heart of that that can be applied in our world? And I think if we look very carefully at this passage we've just considered, even though some of the language and certainly some of the institutions are at this point archaic and probably less than helpful, if completely unhelpful in regard to slavery, there are other things that we can cross over. There are other things we can learn from this. And so I hope this was an exercise in helping you see how that might be done and how we might benefit from even dealing with some of these harder texts that are more challenging. Well, we have one more week in this epistle. Uh, the conclusion, the, the final statements that Paul is going to make about his traveling and other things, we'll look at that next week. Tonight at our After the Through the Bible Zoom chat, we'll discuss this passage more. We'll also pray together. I invite you to attend that if you so desire. The link should be down below. And so until we connect again, I want to leave you with these words of blessing. May the love of God the Father the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the blessed fellowship of the, of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.